Ladies and gentlemen, today is a video that I've been wanting to react. And I, I did put a post on my community post uh, saying if I should react. And I got 50-50 yes and a no. And um, I don't care. I'm still going to do it. I'm going to react to this video because I think I think a lot of us in the Destiny 2 space, or maybe it's just me. I don't know what's going on. But in YouTube, I've noticed an insane insurgence of warframe popularity a bunch of videos of destiny 2 pro goes and plays warframe super crazy i keep getting them non-stop eventually leading to getting a video called warframe is a wake-up call by legendary drops and i will admit i watched up to like three minutes of the video because yes his video originally came up then i saw a reaction video of flats clicked on flats and watched up to like three minutes with him or so and then i i quit and i was like why am i, I like i'm gonna react on my own okay i feel like most people don't know this but if you haven't realized how old my channel is if you look at my old some of my older videos you'll see that i've made some warframe content and you'll be even more entertained by the fact that i am actually technically a warframe og vet i started playing in 2014 here's a fun fact on 2014 i installed warframe in my very old weird branded laptop called compact i never heard of that brand but my parents got me that laptop and i was very grateful that i got a laptop in the first place but at the time as a kid you know i just went "Ooh, video game install surprise surprise my little tiny kid brain didn't realize why is warframe running at like four frames per second <laughs> but uh yeah i just want to see what this video is about as a warframe og oh my god i'm just remembering everything what was it coptering which then led to bullet jump uh freaking warframe the menu used to be just you like sitting on your knees in the middle of the screen was like planets around you there was also the freaking uh what was it i think warframe used to have uh stamina like the movement was super slow i remember uh oh dude i feel like not that many people remember this Excalibur, one of his freaking abilities was just super jump. <laughs> that's how you know the movement system was so freaking it, it was so extraordinary the fact that back then excalibur's i think it was his third ability was a super jump just so you can get to a higher spot in the map <laughs> but anyway i i'm not gonna mess around i will say also i have one issue as um you may not know look at the screen what do you see weird i'll give you five seconds bing bong bing bong too late you're too dumb i don't have a webcam all these streamers like flats and aztec cross because they've done reaction videos to this video they have webcam i don't so i'm just gonna do like a subway surfer of me putting like post gameplay of me playing a game i don't know what game maybe it'll be, it'll be warframe boom there you go and um yeah let's react to this video let's let's see by the way his video will be in the description obviously and uh let's see what this video is all about ladies and gentlemen all right let's let's start let's start the video warframe is a wake-up call oh yeah Look, the phrase is free to play and live service whether by themselves or in combination with one another don't fill players with a lot of confidence and they shouldn't mm -hmm. because they become synonymous with games and studios that are under delivering on a product and service while asking for the absolute most from their audience more time, more engagement, more money, extracting as much as they possibly can while putting in the least amount of effort. What game does that sound like to me, ladies and gentlemen? That's weird. It almost sounds like, oh, okay. kind of like Destiny 2, right? <laughs> I sort of... <laughs> they... <laughs> leadership in... If, what I'm hearing from Bungie is everything is in fault of the leadership. They need to change the leadership, dude. They, they need to get rid of it. And then I, I heard the whole thing of that happened was that, that I'm going to say quote unquote moron because I, I'm not going to, even though I feel like it's proof, like there's proof already since he bought like a bunch of exotic cars or whatever. I'm going to still go on quote unquote moron Pete, stinky Pete over there buying a shit ton of cars and <laughs> leaving Bungie to financial ruin or whatever <laughs> they do all this and then everything about Bungie or destiny 2 now just screams hey give us your time here's a bunch of obsolete tasks i swear to god i feel like every time a new season or a new thing of Bungie comes out it's always do this mission go do a, a public event or something come back and wait next week okay you're ne back next week do the same mission again talk to this person do the same mission again all right, come back. All right, now wait next week. All right, same thing. Go do this mission again. <laughs> do it again. Talk to this person. 
Oh, here's a little cinematic uh, snippet. And I'll ne wait next week. It fe it's been feeling like that for so long. <laughs> it feels like it's just taking my time for no reason and then demanding for more money every time. <laughs> he hit the nail on the coffin. <laughs> Warframe is the most well-known yet under-discussed and under-appreciated games in all of gaming. Oh, it's often hell referred yeah, it to is, as dude. the internet's best-kept secret. And well, okay, well, that, I don't... I don't think it's a secret per se i just feel like people were so more focused on destiny and other games i'm pretty like i feel like that warframe hasn't fallen in player base it's been i feel like it's always been stagnant and slowly growing when a new thing comes out of warframe people go back into it and then it falls back to that stagnant line which isn't a bad thing it's just people didn't want to give it a time of day oh my god i just realized homie has the same freaking mic st like mic what is it a mic stand as me holy crap what the hell I just we have the same setup. What the hell, Legendary Dress? I have the same freaking Samson. <laughs> We're both wearing the gamer glasses, or I think those are just regular glasses. The only difference is I don't have all those guitars. I don't have a room because I suck, and I don't have <laughs> headphones because I don't want the head hair. I have IEMs. Yeah, that's right. IEMs, number one. Let's go. I love IEMs so much. I'm tired of it being a secret. So am I. For all Even intents and purposes, Warframe think it's secret, is the blueprint by which many of these free-to-play games and live service games should be following, but they're not. Yup. It's a game that is tirelessly supported by its developer and by its community in a way that I don't even think any other game can even replicate. And once you guys hear about some of this stuff, it's going to blow your mind. Right, Free-to-play and brother. live service is supposed to be a way for developers to be able to deliver a smaller product and grow it over time. Be able to deliver a valuable service, a valuable product, and grow it while the community supports it. And that's the kind of game that Warframe is. That's what we're going to be talking about today. If I remember, didn't they... Um, well, the thing that sucks is if I was where I am now, I would have done it. Like, if I was an auto right now with a bit of money, I would have done it. But obviously, back then, I was a kid. Not only that, I was like a year late to the party because I didn't know. And I didn't have money. I think they did a... They were so in need of money before the game came out that they did a wasn't it like a supporter pack where the excalibur prime scana prime and lato prime was and it was like a hundred dollars or something like that and that eventually actually worked out or something luckily today's sponsor is actually the game that inspired warframe oh, okay what game i've played world inspired of tanks warframe. multiple times oh, get over out of here my <laughs> friends and this is an easy suggestion to make i was world about to be over here like wait what game inspired is it that other game no it's world of tanks over a decade now with over a hundred million registered users, oh, hundreds a million, of huh? tanks, and tons of customization, high yeah. fidelity graphics, incredible sound design, and <clears> hundreds <throat> of hours of gameplay. The extensive arsenal includes tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks, Damn. providing you with a wide range of options for different combat strategies. Mm. It's a free-to-play game that brings you massive battles with a huge variety of tanks. Whether you're charging in guns blazing or sneaking up on enemies, there's always a new way to play. And here's the best part. New players will get what an amazing it? deal using the invite code combat oh! and the link in the description below. Go to his link and click on put on invite code combat. Tank, Let's go. 150,000 credits and seven days of premium access. Plus Damn, you get to try seven out three days. Three other tier six tanks for 10 battles each. Just use the link in the description below to get started. You heard so him. What, not my link. His his link in the description. Okay, I'm not I'm not that popular. What is Warframe? It's a looter shooter, live service MMO with a third person perspective. You play as a Warframe. You're dashing through levels, taking down enemies, farming up materials, currency, and other items so that you can continue to build more weapons and more Warframes to use. God, the Warframes amount of vary freaking in their items looks and in this abilities. game. Some of them play like a ninja. Wait, others. Oh, what the hell is that skin? Who is? Is that Hydroid? I didn't even know Hydroid had that skin. What the hell? Okay. That is so Moana looking. It's like a battering ram or even a wizard. There's even a Oh, he has it. He has the ember. He has the ember heirloom skin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a man of culture, I see. Frame that lets you create your own music so that you can buff other players. You have pets, Octavia, ships, let's go. clans, PvP, personal housing, boss fights, a roguelike, a fighting game, open worlds, and more. It has consistently stayed in the top 20 of the most played games on Steam for over a mm -hmm. decade now, and in doing that, there is something inherently special here. If we look at the game's player base on Steam, while it's not burning the world down- Oh, crap! I, I forgot he put the graph. Yeah, 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 there it is. There it is. Yeah, look, basically stagnant, which isn't a bad thing. Sane Peaks, it's maintained its player base consistently since 2013, 
and it's only continued to grow. So how has Warframe maintained that success? Why is nobody talking about it? And unlike many other live service games, why aren't we hearing people complaining about it or how it mistreats its players? Well, to answer that, we need to understand the game's history. Oh my God, Rebecca is so old. It isn't a boob window, it's boob stained glass. <laughs> I can't believe people are being so rude to Rebecca, you should treat your elders with respect. You couldn't weep through because sight and death perception is the first thing to go to. That of its creators. Now you may recognize the name Digital Extremes, renowned for their early work on Unreal Tournament. Okay, now this, at this point forward, is where I think I stopped watching with uh, Flats. So this is all new video content for me now. In partnership with Epic Wait, Games, they played a pivotal role in shaping the landscape of multiplayer first-person shooters. They were what? among the first to popularize key features like online multiplayer, power weapons, team deathmatch. Wait, I'm sorry. Wait, what? What game is... Is that... Is that freaking... Extremes, renowned for their early work on Unreal Tournament in partnership with Epic Games. They Wait, they they worked on Unreal? What the hell? I didn't know this. What they the played a pivotal role in shaping the landscape of multiplayer first-person shooters. They were among the first to popularize I didn't know features this. like online multiplayer, power weapons, team deathmatch, and capture the flag, laying the ground for many of the multiplayer games that we play today. After parting ways with Epic Games, as Epic went on to make Gears of War with Xbox Studios. Oh, dude, yeah, yes, nostalgia. <laughs> That's what I started around the time when I started playing when it looked like this. Oh, and look, I, I think that is the stamina they decided bar, right? To on pitch the their own game idea, and they tried to do it for over a decade. Yeah, there it is, that the stamina was, I was Dark right. Sector. They struggled to find a publisher for this dark sci-fi MMO oh, concept sector, that they had, yeah. and ultimately Digital Extremes was forced into doing work for hire just to be able to keep the company afloat. Oh shit! The decision to take on work for hire projects while necessary for financial stability came with its own difficulties. The studio faced a cycle of hiring employees for specific projects and then laying them off once that project concluded. This practice is commonplace for work for hire studios. However, it disrupted the lives of their employees and their families, a situation that the studio founder has regretted since then. He believed that publishers often lacked a clear vision and that digital extremes would have been better off just focusing on smaller self-controlled projects as seen with independent studios that tend to produce higher quality work when they're given full creative control. Despite the continuous efforts to pitch Dark Sector to publishers, the studio continued to face rejection. Prim oh, my, oh my god. Am I going crazy? Is that a, a lotus symbol right there on the O? The flower here, then it blooms down, and then it blooms... Oh, it is! I never noticed that. I already, I knew about Dark Sector, and I knew this was like... like It had some assets of Warframe. I knew this like years ago. I just never noticed the lotus symbol in the O. Primarily the due hell? to a lack of interest when it came to sci-fi games on the side of publishers, a sentiment that somehow never even changed even with the success of Halo. In a desperate move, Digital Extremes caved to a publisher's demands, shifting Dark Sector from a sci-fi MMO to a game that emulated the success of Resident yep. Evil 4 at the time. There's that Excalibur this change involved prototype transforming armor, the protagonist skin. from a space ninja to a CIA operative yep. named Hayden Tenno, which strayed very far from the original concept. The new version of Dark Sector struggled to be able to find an audience. However, it eventually did and gained respectable reviews as well. See, I never played Dark Sector. I don't know. I, I kind of wish. I, I feel like. Is it on Steam? Now that I think. I feel like playing Dark Sector just to, like, kind of understand and see what it was and see if how that shaped warframe slightly if any of you played dark sector let me know in the comments if it was good or bad after the release of dark sector the industry started to trend away from double a releases to triple a games and this made for more issues at digital extremes the studio which had previously worked on bioshock's multiplayer and the darkness 2 found itself struggling to find any contracts as they began to dry up and publishers wanted to start making games in-house observing the success of free-to-play games like world of tanks in 2010 Digital Extreme saw an opportunity in an emerging market. They didn't see free-to-play as a way to Damn, be able to milk players. Tanks, is that they old? recognized and saw the potential to be able to create something smaller and grow the game over time, rather than trying to pursue a traditional release. I didn't even think Facing that imminent tanks financial that old. collapse with only 12 months of funds remaining, Digital Extremes decided to pursue a long-held vision for what used to be Dark Sector, and then was now codenamed Lotus. Within two months, they developed a working demo featuring spaceship raids and procedurally generated loot and layouts with an emphasis on 
co-op and PvE gameplay, recognizing there was a gap in the market. They approached free-to-play publishers, asking for support, but they were getting rejected yet again. Undeterred, Digital Extremes decided to self-fund the project, with only nine months of funds remaining, wanting to give it their all rather than simply just walk away. Man, it must be crazy. Imagine those publishers now being like, damn, we messed up so badly. <laughs> we should have we should have taken the deal. <laughs> I want to know why they didn't accept it. I don't know. The only thing that comes to mind is maybe there was like so many sci-fi things going on and they probably thought like, oh, crap, another sci-fi thing. Uh, we don't want to deal with this. We want something new. Uh, that's like the only thing that comes into mind of why they went, yeah, we don't want to take this. Uh, good luck. But hey, their loss. The development of the alpha version of the game saw significant involvement from Rebecca Ford, an intern who led the creation of their community team. This team was crucial in gathering and responding to player feedback, a strategy that helped shape the game's development and ultimately its success. Embracing the success of Kickstarter campaigns that were going on at the time, Digital Extremes introduced supporter packs to raise oh, additional funds. There this it is. I was right. Supporter packs. Okay, yes. Which, while initially slow, proved ultimately effective and ah. demonstrated that there was an audience for their game. Thus, Warframe was born. A game over a decade in the making who had faith in itself, scorned by an industry nobody else wanted to make it except for them. It released into beta on Steam in 2013 to over 20,000 players and has only continued to grow since. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I've come to realize that the vast majority of the studios that we grew up loving, the games that we grew up loving, the biggest studios and publishers that are out there all came from very similar humble beginnings, but the vast majority of them forgot about it. Dude, and the oh ones that my don't God, yeah. end up being the ones that are the most loved and appreciated. See, I don't, I don't recall anything big with Blizzard in my childhood the only thing was overwatch loved it and now when you look at blizzard it's just disgusting and the worst part is like uh i i saw some videos of like people reacting of how blizzard was before i think was it um oh crap i feel so bad i, I watched that youtuber he's also british and he, his edits are amazing oh my god i feel so bad for forgetting him i'll put your your channel on this on screen right now i watched this video and i remember like watching the intro being like holy crap blizzard blizzard must have been awesome especially for people who play like starcraft and uh world of warcraft and all that and then now you look at blizzard dog water you look at bungie halo everybody loved it and i was in love with it so much so that I started learning a bit of the lore and everything, and then S Destiny 1 came out. There was still a bit of, we kind of care about the people, but then it just slowly started decaying, decaying, and now we have how Destiny 2 is right now. Every It's just so bad right now in the gaming sphere. Everything, all companies feel like they're so greedy and they just want to steal. It just feels like we don't want to make a game that you like. We want to make a game so we can steal your money and your time. <laughs> Look at Larian Studios. Their story is almost identical to Digital Extremes. They started off <sighs> making their own games to limited Crap, success. I don't know they that did studio. Uh, work for hire for a while just to be able to keep the doors open. When that industry started to dry up and move away, they went to go make their own game in Divinity Original Sin. They danced with bankruptcy, almost losing the entire studio, but they found an audience that wanted to support it, and now look at them. Baldur's Gate 3 is heralded as one of the greatest oh. games of all time. Oh, they're they the one that makes Baldur's Oh, okay. As they deserve to do so. So I, I look around I, the I'm industry not, right now. I'm not, that, I'm not that big into like Baldur's Gate and all that, but it, if that's a studio, okay. So damn, they have this, they had the same similar situation to freaking Digital Extreme. Oh, okay. A lot of studios that are making games, not because they want to make them, but because they're profit motivated. Uh, what did I just say? Purely profit motivated. <laughs> they no longer look at players as anything other than tools for making money. And that's it. Rather than looking at them for what they actually are, which is a means to be able to deliver a higher quality product, use their feedback and their information to be able to earn their money and then by extension, make your game even that more popular. Because when players are happy, they tend to talk about it a heck of a lot more. That's the other thing that I find it so weird. I feel like this is like business 101. Be humble, be good, and make a good product for your customer, for your audience. <laughs> Is there going to be hardships? Of course there is. There, there's always going to be a hardship. I mean, for example, look at a restaurant. You can make a restaurant, sell sandwiches. As long as you strive to make good sandwiches, you'll find yourself meeting a lot of customers who will be, yeah, I love the sandwich. And then every once in a while, you'll meet one, one or two little assholes who will be like, 
your sandwich sucked and you you just have to suck it up and be like oh we apologize for it we're sorry you didn't like it would you want us to give you a refund or would you like to try something else in the menu just be humble about it you know even though they're being an asshole and you want to punch the crap out of them you just have to suck it up there's always going to be people who like your things and people who don't like your things but as long as you're freaking humble there's going to be more people that like it than hate it and i feel like so many companies just don't realize this today it's like one of the most forbidden business practices for some reason and nobody knows why i just don't i i just don't understand the practice who the hell is leading all these companies and they're just like nah no don't make a good product nah make a crap product that will steal freaking money from our player base yeah we'll do that i mean look at call of duty <laughs> used to be an amazing game loved call of duty now it's all about here's some skins <laughs> and i've also noticed that games are a form of art and without soul there is no art and in the case of games, I think a lot of players are starting to wake up and realize they can see it in your trailers, they can see it in your gameplay, they can see it when the soul isn't there. And when they know it's there and they see it's there, they're into that game. But when they don't see it, they don't want to have anything to do with it. And I think that's why we've seen a lot of games over the last few years fail. Digital Extremes started out with good, great intentions, to be honest with you. But that doesn't mean that they didn't make the same mistakes that many other free-to-play and live service games make time and time again and that's with its monetization but the difference is they learn from their mistakes oh yeah i don't think anybody can thing? disagree with this recently over the last few years both live service and free-to-play games have permeated through every space in the entire gaming industry every single company wants their fortnite counter-strike genshin impact whatever it might be <laughs> and of course they would because they draw in revenues it would make you wonder why anybody would ever want to make another full-priced game again but with the introduction... Okay, well, hold on. I know CSGO is free to play right now. I've always said this. I mean, Destiny 2 is also another perfect example of what I'm going to say right now. CSGO and, and Destiny 2 are the things that happen to me. I paid full price for them, okay? A lot of Destiny 2 players and a lot of CSGO players paid full price for the game. We enjoyed them for X amount of years. And then suddenly the companies went, hey, we're going to make them free to play now. Even though it's not a big deal, like... It, it was technically i bought the game and i enjoyed it for x amount of time for destiny 2 was quote unquote enjoyed it because i think we all know that the beginning of destiny 2 was absolute garbage it was hot mess it was horrible bright idea to make freaking destiny 1 players go from here's a primary here's a secondary shotgun sniper or whatever and then a power rocket launcher to here's two weak primaries and then everything else shoved into power bright idea and then feel extremely slow but whatever in a way i know i should i can't get annoyed because i paid full price and enjoyed x amount of time and then they went free to play but it's still a punch in the gut knowing dude i paid full price for this game just for you to make it go free to play and for a gamer it's something you're scared to hear because now it goes from there's at least a bit of like a leeway to prevent hackers from going to we're gonna hack oh i got banned i have to rebuy the game and then I think the way it works, because I don't know, is maybe re have to you have to rebuy like the cheats or whatever, or maybe it's just you can just reuse them. I don't know. But at least there was a leeway of I have to buy the game again. Now that leeway is gone. And then we saw how that happened in Destiny 2, where every freaking Crucible game was littered with nothing but hackers to the point where even streamers were like, I'm not going to trials is horrible because every freaking game is a hacker 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 then the infamous websites of will carry you to flawless and they were just like hackers carrying people and the saddest thing is that there were some people that actually paid for that service and whoever if you, any of you paid for that service go to hell you 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 suck just go to aim labs that is your, your that's your carry and it's free the infamous thing is csgo actually does feel like a free to play game now destiny 2 on the other hand i think we all know it's not free to play it's free to try and then you have to pay x amount of money to play the game and of free to play live service games we've seen year over year month over month players are losing ground losing choice and losing their money mm -hmm. free to play has become synonymous with cutting content and player achievement and putting a price tag on it while the gameplay itself is free, the model has incentivized developers to paywall everything in the game or put in absurd time restrictions and... What, what did I just say? That's basically Bungie. That's Destiny 2 right now. <laughs> yeah, it's free to play. Oh, how do I do this dungeon? Oh, you need a dungeon key. Oh, how do I do this right? Oh, you need to buy the DLC. <laughs> it's like that Allstate, or is it Allstate commercial of, oh, you almost got it. You gotta be quicker than that. <laughs> 
the fisherman is holding the freaking dungeon key and the girl's just like, give it to me. <laughs> hurdles for players to be able to overcome just so they can try to earn anything with their own time or their own skill. Studios today are incentivized to actively harm the player experience and lower the quality of the overall product all in the name of higher profits. Oh, preach it. Digital Extremes mm -hmm. was incredibly nervous about getting into free to play because they were afraid that they were going to do it wrong. And in fact, they did. At first, they started selling power. And it wasn't oh, the reputation that, that's what that they wanted to create for themselves. At the creation of Warframe, you could double the capacity of your mod yeah. and skill tree slots in your Warframes. However, there was no way to be able to earn this in-game, and the only way that you could get it was by paying for it with real money. That's what it was. That's what it was. The Orkin reactors, you just you just couldn't get or you, it's not that you couldn't get them. It's just that they were so rare. They were so heavily reliant on how lucky you were to get them. I think because I rem I do remember getting some of the blueprints if I'm right from from back then. Basically, the most viable way of getting it was paying it with plat or in other words with real money. Early on before the game's beta release, Digital Extreme saw the player's feedback regarding this issue and removed it and any other perceived pay for power microtransactions, vowing for fair monetization to be a core tenant of the studio moving forward. In that move, and other changes that they made due to their deep involvement in the early foundations of their games community, they fostered a positive community spirit and gained even more support. In an interview six years ago with Danny O'Dwyer of No Clip Documentaries, they mentioned how difficult it was for them to be able to find any marketing or visibility because at the time, nobody wanted to touch free-to-play games. However, the positive community that they had already started to culture, the fact that they had been listening to their community ended up catching the attention of the late great commentator total biscuit who came to cover the game and catapult its popularity <laughs> ah, into the there mainstream. It is. yeah there's the old there's the old screen <laughs> nostalgia baby i remember you just sitting in the vast majority of space and then there's just planets floating around you and you just click <laughs> i think that this is one of the most valuable lessons for digital extremes or any company to learn and it's that good things happen to good developers especially those who treat their players as well as digital extremes and listens to their feedback. Dude, the, the game, game developers large so and small slow. need to recognize and then look that at they this. are providing a product. The gameplay with Volt looks so slow. He only ran for like two seconds. It was the Call of Duty logic of, oh, I'm a, I'm a badass soldier. I can only run for like five seconds <laughs> and then I need to stop. <laughs> Same thing there. Super Space Ninja with a freaking magical battle armor suit. I can only run for five seconds. <laughs> and service to us, not the other way around. The expectation is on them to create a fun, fair, entertaining, and yep. valuable experience in exchange for our money. When I see game developers posting on Reddit talking about how they hate gamers because oh of my. YouTube live stream comments, or how a lead Starfield developer makes a Twitter thread saying, funny how disconnected some players are from the realities of game development, oh and yet they God. speak with complete authority. I mean, I can guess what it takes to make a hostess Twinkie, but I don't work in the factory, so what the hell do I know, really? Yet again, I was right. It's the same thing. My example was, if you work at a restaurant making sandwiches, there's gonna be people who like it, people who don't. People who don't, they'll voice their opinion, and instead of being an idiot, yes, I know you wanna punch them, but the right thing to do is be respectful, listen to their feedback, even though it's very hurtful or maybe very nicely constructive, doesn't matter. You accept it, you respond kindly and move on. And that's how it works. And he just basically said exactly what I just said. But then now you have people like Emil over here who get angry and start yelling. Nobody wants to, f <laughs> nobody wants to listen to you raging about people giving you attitude. It doesn't matter. I know that there's people that don't understand the whole gaming industry. I'm one of them. I know little to nothing, but I still have a right to voice my opinion. And I know it's very, you really want to punch people when they say things. But the best thing to do is just kindly say thank you for the constructive feedback. Like, criticism, move on. <laughs> Not a lot. And neither of these opinions that these people have are in the minority of opinions. With what authority do players speak? With their money. Yes. They are your paying customers. Paying My money. Customers. While players may not know exactly how to voice their concerns, and oftentimes will do it in the wrong way, you still should be listening to them because they are telling you oh. that something is wrong with your game. And it. No. I. What did I just say? 
Just listen to them. Shut up. Move on. <laughs> Keep working on your game. It's that simple. You know how many times in, in, in my old job, I've had people throw items at me. They got so angry that they threw items at me from the store. Hit me in the chest. And I didn't get angry. I was just like, okay. And then other, you know what felt nice? Other customers who were actually nice went, what is wrong with that man? And I went, don't know. How can I help you? Super simple. Do you think I just wanted to sit there and go like, oh, I, oh, oh, I, oh, I hate you. Oh, yes, of course I did. But I just didn't because the professional thing to do is breathe in, let it happen. He didn't hurt me. It was just, he threw an item. It tapped me in the chest. I'm a big boy move on with my life it's that simple why because my mom and dad taught me why choose violence when i can just easily just avoid it and have a better life just moving on with a peaceful mind none of this caveman ooga booga me angry want to kill it's just simple as oh i'm not hurt he didn't hit me in the eye i lost an eye i didn't lose an eye i didn't lose an arm nothing happened move on with my life it's that simple <laughs> the end of the day all they want is a better product, which only serves to make you more money in the end. Yep. We've seen developers stray from the side of players. However, how many developers have you seen remove a microtransaction from their game because players were using it too much? <laughs> when Warframe introduced colors for their pet skins, they didn't realize that they had inadvertently created a gambling mechanic where players were trying to search for the rarest skin colors and the combinations that they wanted. <laughs> DE saw that a player had rolled his pet's color 200 times and their stomach sank. Within a day and a half, they had removed the mechanic from the game and reworked it without the need for player feedback. The spirit of that Jesus. can be found throughout Thank the entire you, game. As of a recent update, now everything in the game, just about everything in the game, is earnable in-game with very few outliers. Warframe uses Platinum as its in-game premium currency, and it's fully tradable. Players can go out, farm valuable resources, mods, weapons, and Warframe blueprints, and then trade with other players without ever even spending a dime. You would think that this is trapped behind some type of end game progression or something, right? Nope. No, you can start doing this within the first 15 to 20 hours of playing the game. I was already trading items with other players and stockpiling currency from the minute that I had started. Mm -hmm. While players still have the option to buy anything that they want from the game's in-game shop, all of those things, or at least the vast majority of them outside of cosmetics and color palettes, can be earned in-game. He's basically right. You can easily start getting a bunch of prime items and everything for free like start of the game the fact that you can get all this prime stuff is freaking crazy i will say though you do have to take a bit of time to learn the economy system of warframe which if you don't know it well best place to go is the warframe what is it warframe.market just type in whatever you want to sell and it immediately shows you what the average price of it is selling so it's super simple as well. That's the one thing I love about Warframe is doesn't matter. You can start the game immediately start getting platinum without even spending a freaking dime, not even a penny. And you can do that just right off the bat of the game. So, Mr. YouTuber, that means that Warframe must have the most difficult and high end equipment behind paywalls or something, right? Nope. It has to be insanely difficult to get. Hell no. No. The pinnacle warframes and weapons are called primes. Oh, you can Revenant earn Prime? these yeah. by cracking relics, and you get relics constantly while you're playing the game. Oh, dude, that's that's also another thing right now. If you start the game right now, Revenant Prime. To my surprise, I, like, dude, I, I, you can tell I was very out of the game for Warframe for a bit when I started playing it again recently. The last time I remember about Amber was when Amber Prime was selling for like I think nearly a thousand plat or something, and I remember I shit myself when when I was opening up relics or doing keys or whatever i forgot what it was i there was something before the relics it was a key and then you would go jesus christ I, i'm i forgot but it was something you would get like a void key and then go do it i got a freaking amber prime blueprint i shit myself because that was the last thing i needed to be able to craft amber and i remember my old self being like <clears throat> crap do I sell Ember Prime for a, a crap ton of plat or do I build Ember Prime? And I decided I'm gonna build Ember Prime. Now, Ember Prime is selling for like 80 plat, which is practically nothing. Revenant Prime, funny enough, Revenant Prime is one of those freaking Warframes that you would, as a beginner, you definitely wanna strive to get because he's so simple. If you wanna farm him, it's gonna take a while. Or you can sell things. I think he sells for about 30 platinum or so. So it's super simple. Just play the game for a bit, open up relics, sell some stuff. Hopefully you get up to 30 or 40 plat. I forgot how much he is right there. But then you can get a very overpowered Warframe. Super simple. And here's a little fun fact. 
prime some prime warframes are extremely easier to get than certain normal warframes for example grendel grendel is a pain in the ass to get but his prime is extremely simple because you just get relics boom and get them and i think he sells for as well like 40 or 50 plat or something around there i don't know that's how easy it is to get a better version of the normal warframe in the start of warframe just get a simple amount of plat boom you have it and warframe or revenant super simple press two you're you're not you're not taking any damage pinnacle of warframes and weapons are called primes you can earn these by cracking relics and you get relics constantly while you're playing the game when you go to do these missions yep. to crack the relics, with you're fang, playing with four center, players okay. and all four of you can choose yep. to use the exact same relic, which would then increase your chances of being able to get what you wanted because everybody can choose from everyone else's rewards. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. If you never played Warframe and you're thinking about getting into Warframe, when you're opening up relics, never do it alone. Always do it public. That way you have more chances of better loot. Meaning that even if you're in a party that isn't coordinated and you're all running different relics, if you don't get what you want out of yours, you can just get a copy of somebody else's thing if it's more valuable. Mm -hmm. You can choose to get whatever you want. Every weapon, every frame, companion, and otherwise is at your fingertips. You can earn your way through Warframe without ever even spending a dime, and many players have. There is no time wasting in Warframe. And what's even more crazier is that, adding to this absurdity, they show players how not to spend money within their <laughs> yeah. premium shop. If you go to their premium shop and look at any of the items available in it, next to every item, it tells you how to go earn that item in-game rather than spending yeah. money. <laughs> you can look at it and they'll be like, hey, instead of giving us money, this is how you can get it for free. <laughs> Go do this instead. <laughs> they teach players how not to spend money in their shop. But that doesn't mean that players don't support the game. In fact, they do quite a lot because by making things so accessible, giving massive discounts on their currency and things like that, being able to just get all the things that you want in the game by playing it, players just want to spend money on the game yep warframe is the perfect example of i love this game so much and the developers themselves are doing everything possible to tell you of how to not spend a dime on their game that i want to support them this warframe is the one game where i truly feel like a lot of people go cosmetics actually matter in this game because it's a way to support this developer that cares about us and not only that i get fashion which if you don't know anything about warframe warframe's end game usually for a lot of people is surviving a long run with very difficult enemies that will one shot you or it's fashion frame you're so high into the end game that now your only goal is how can i make my warframe look extremely sick i want to drip them out hold on i'm gonna i'm gonna go take a dump i'll be right back several days later okay i am back for my dumpy wumpy time to resume because they want to support it because they love the game so much not because they feel like they need to imagine that imagine a world in which the players are not spending money on a game because they need to overcome some fabricated barrier that's put in place and if they spend money they're going to be able to get through it faster or get through it at all no instead they're spending money because they actually want to support the game they just are enjoying themselves and want to spend the money Mind you, some of this is definitely driven by convenience, but the vast majority of players just love the game and want to support it. And that's not to say that there aren't areas worth criticizing. I'm still not a fan of the fact of them having 12 to 72 hour crafting timers on weapons oh, yeah. and warframes. That's just, it's just too much. <laughs> I don't know what crazy. else to say about it. It's just too much. The thing is, I feel like I've gotten so used to it now. What is it? Warframes are three days to craft but funny enough you do have to remember it's technically not three days to build a warframe if you do it all right it will be three days and 12 hours because you have to remember you have to find the neuroptics you have to find the chassis and then you have to find the systems if you build the all those three components at the same time it'll be done in 12 hours meaning technically a warframe you have to wait for 12 hours if you build them all three together at the same time. You wait 12 hours, you collect all those three components. Then you start building the actual Warframe, which will then be three days. So technically speaking, building a Warframe is actually three days and 12 hours. And then if you, oh Jesus Christ, if you build them all one by one, the max time of building a Warframe would be what, four days and 12 hours? Because 
building the warframe itself is three days neuroptics is 12 hours you wait for that to finish then you build a chassis you wait for that to finish that's 24 hours that's one entire day so four days and then last but not least you finally get the components to build the system that's 12 hours so in total the max is four days and 12 hours and then weapons they're not that bad but it's still for the most part most weapons will usually be like a 12 hour crafting time but you have to remember some weapons are easier than others to get uh for example they're like the most some basic weapons that you can buy for a couple of credits but they're like very like beginner friendly weapons so they're not end game like the mark one brad and then i think you could buy the brad in if i'm right then there's weapons that you can buy the blueprints for like twenty five thousand credits or something in the market and then you just need to get the components like neurodes and stuff like that and then you can build it wait 12 hours then there's some weapons that you will have to get their stock receiver and barrel that usually applies to most of the prime weapons and the same thing you just build it that's 12 hours waiting and then there's some weapons that you have to get the blueprint then stock receiver barrel but then you have to build the stock and then build the receiver and then build the barrel it, yeah it's annoying and also there's a big limitation on the amount of weapon and warframe slots inventory oh my slots God, that are available yeah. early on for players that's something that you're going to touch on something else fixed but okay so he didn't okay so yes that's the other thing once you start reaching to the point where you start leveling up a bunch of weapons you ha either have two choices which is you sell the weapon you sell the warframe or you keep them but you buy a bunch of slots and each slot if i remember for uh warframes it's 20 for one or two slots for a warframe and then for a weapon i know for sure a weapon if you buy if you buy it it's 12 platinum but you get two slots for a weapon but I think the Warframe is it's one slot for 20. I will admit they did kind of do something good, but this mainly only applies to Warframes, which is if you get the Prime version, the regular version of the Warframe is it's practically useless you know unless in certain it's useless in some scenarios like for example if you have like a fond memory with this Warframe then you don't have to sell it or delete it but they added the Hellman system which basically allows you to subsume your freaking warframe that you choose and it has to be a normal it can't be a war uh, prime meaning there's an incentive to now get rid of your old warframe and keep the prime warframe because now you can subsume your old warframe and be able to use that ability to transfer it to other warframes so that's the nice thing you don't have to you kind of you kind of save a bit of inventory space with uh, the warframe side weapon side it's a bit more difficult because you have the regular version of the gun and then the prime version of the gun if it has a prime version and then you have to decide whether you want to delete the old one or keep it and then there's an the other factor that makes it harder to delete some guns for some people is one, you already put an orc in catalyst, and I'll touch on the orc, orc in catalyst situation as well. Two, I have to keep this old gun because it has a better riven disp disposition. Meaning, the more riven disposition means the better your riven mod. And the riven mod is just like a very powerful mod that gives you a bunch of bonuses in one mod. Depending on the gun, primes usually will have a lower riven disposition than the regular one. Like, for example, um, uh, Braden and Braden Prime. That's a good example. Braden has five riven in this position versus brad and prime that has four so in other words people will get to the point where if they get a very good ribbon and it's a good weapon but the regular version has better ribbon disposition that ribbon is going to make the normal gun more powerful than the prime version so then some people will kind of hesitate on whether they should delete the old weapon or keep it because it'll technically be a bit more powerful than the prime version so that becomes an issue and then the orkin situation the orkin catalyst situation is if you played warframe i don't know if this is just me but a big issue is you'll notice that when you're playing warframe you'll have a bunch of orkin reactors which is the thing that doubles your capacity your mod capacity for your normal for your warframes compared to weapons warframes are less than the we the weapon so you tend to focus more on the weapons i have i have no orc and catalyst so now you have to find a way to get orc and catalyst which is from night wave getting 75 credits but that means you have to upgrade the season the night wave season pass thing to get 75 credits to then buy an orc and catalyst or get platinum and buy orc and catalyst or sometimes there's limited time events from lotus that she'll give out a orc and catalyst blueprint you either have to get lucky from the sorting mission to get a, a blue a blueprint another thing that's very 
annoying for me. And maybe it's for other people. Oh, oh my God, I choked up. I don't know if it's just for me, but I feel like that's another issue. The Oricon Catalyst thing. The thing is, is that the longer you play the game, the less those things become an issue because you have so many other things that you're working on, leveling up, playing as, farming for, while all these other things are building in the background that you really don't even notice it all that much. Mm -hmm. And... While there's room for improvement, this is largely the most ethical live service game I've ever seen monetized. And I don't think any other game wants to try to compete on those terms. And they definitely don't want to compete on their content. Warframe's first turning point came when the game released on Steam, which marked a critical success and provided the studio with the necessary resources to be able to continue to support <laughs> that the Ember development game. Skin? <laughs> Unlike competitive shooters that can maintain an audience with minimal updates, Warframe faced the challenge of sustaining interest in a PvE-centric game, which is far more difficult. To overcome this, Digital Extremes heavily leaned on the experienced development team who had weathered the storm through the toughest times and possessed the deep institutional knowledge that was necessary to make the game successful. If it wasn't for the fact that they held on to their employees when the game and the studio was facing its closure, they likely would have never been able to make the game the success that it is today. In the years following the game's release on Steam, Warframe saw a rapid expansion in content. The studio introduced clans, player hubs, a plethora of new uh, weapons yeah. and Warframes, and diverse gameplay elements like open world areas, vehicles, and space combat. But the most significant shift in the game's identity came with the release of The Second Dream, a cinematic quest that redefined oh. Warframe as a game. This quest introduced fully voice acted, high quality cinematic experiences with intricate writing and storytelling that elevated the game from a compelling free-to-play title to a truly exceptional experience. No longer was Warframe just a free-to-play game, it was just a great game that happened to be free-to-play. Digital Extremes continued to push boundaries with subsequent updates, including the new War, Whispers in the Walls, and the upcoming major update, Warframe 1999. These expansions demonstrate a Level oh crap, yeah, working 90, 1999, the demo's out, oh, I should, I don't know if it's available or if it's only for invited certain people, I mean, if it's available, let me know if you want to see me make a video on that, because, uh, I, who am I kidding, most likely I will, but I, I need to check that out, yeah, I forgot the demo is out or something, right, yeah, okay. Level of writing, character development, and cinematic quality that's typically associated with AAA blockbuster titles and reflect nothing of what we've seen in typical free-to-play games. The studio's ambition to deliver high-end content remained evident with every release, further increasing the game's reputation among players both new and old. That's what's made the Warframe that we have today. One of the systems I was the most shocked by was at one point I unlocked what I can best describe as Sea of Thieves in Space. You get a railjet, <laughs> rail a jet. fully customizable ship that you can upgrade. It has multiple weapons that are controlled by other players in co-op. You hire NPCs to manage the ship. You fight other ships. You can board other ships, steal other ships, and raid enemy bases. While the feature didn't land well on release and it had yeah. its issues. I was about to say, if I remember, not that some people were like, it's cool, but it wasn't anything super big to look at. What is available today is an absolute blast to play and it feels like it's completely native to the game and like it could have been there from the start. In the landscape of live service and free to play games, many developers opt for the oh, safe approach, very. focusing on incremental updates and minor changes rather than undertaking any significant overhaul. This safe strategy often results in steady, gradual improvements, but most major additions and transformative changes end up being locked behind paid expansions, premium content, and microtransactions. Typically, free-to-play games and live service games will introduce minor tweaks, seasonal updates, and limited time offers to try to keep players engaged. While Warframe does the exact same thing, they aren't strangers to making big splashes with major updates, and all the while, they're not charging the players a dime. Other games yeah. with standard offerings can sometimes refresh the experience and provide new incentives to be able to log in, but they rarely bring the wide sweeping changes that might significantly alter the gameplay or narrative, making the game overall feel more stale. I'll give kudos to games like Fortnite, who often radically change their map, put in new modes, and give more ways for players to be able to express themselves in games, like even creating their own games within Fortnite. However, the vast majority of games don't do this, and in combination with that lack of risk, 
they often let go of the developers that got them to where they are in the first place, yeah. ignoring the players that got them to where they are in the first place. I will admit, yeah, that that is one cool thing about Warframe is they're not they're not scared to take a risk on certain things. I mean, like for example, the whole railjack thing. Not that many people were so into it, but they still did it. And to be honest, now it's actually a pretty fun thing. I don't play railjack missions as much, but it's still pretty fun and the fact that it's there is cool i mean they have that they have the freaking 2d freaking mortal Kombat fighter game in warframe they have conclave which is pvp but that uh, that 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 didn't survive long i still remember when the first time i played it it was just it was a mess to be honest i remember sometimes i would shoot people and it wouldn't register and then suddenly like two seconds later it would register that i killed them it was weird the one thing i love about warframe as well is that to my knowledge they haven't removed they haven't removed a lot of content the main thing that comes off the, my head that i remember that i know they removed was raids i remember doing raids with a uh, old clan that i was in back in the day suddenly when i got back into destiny or destiny warframe the raids were gone and then i found i found out later on that they digital extreme said that they re removed it because they felt like it didn't fit well with warframe call me crazy i feel like they can pull it off they just need to work on it Imagine if Warframe had that similar thing as Destiny where they Warframe had dungeons or freaking raids. Obviously they did have raids and I, if I remember it was okay but it what it didn't give me that breathtaking feel. Like it was I I'll, I'll admit it was nowhere near the breathtaking feeling of getting into a Destiny 2 raid. It didn't have that feeling. If they kind of worked on it and polished it, I feel like they could Sorry, that was the sound of my bottle closing. My water bottle I'm holding on and playing with it. If Warframe, if Digital Extreme worked on it, I'm pretty sure they could make something extremely, hopeful, somewhat similar to a Destiny 2 raid feel. And as a result, they hollow out their experience, leaving them with nowhere to go. There's too much focus on monetization, and it's leading to a disparity between the expectations of the player and the financial outlook of the developer. Today, we have developers mm -hmm. that are understaffed, underpaid, under a lot of pressure, under delivering to their audience while for some odd reason the company is still expecting more money. You have CEOs that are out there projecting growing profit without investing in growing content. And their expectation is because you're playing, then you must be paying, and I'm sick of it. Look, just recently I saw with Apex Legends, the big drama that cropped up around it, where basically, long story short, developer goes in and makes it where you can no longer earn the next battle pass by completing the last battle pass oh i remember this previously yeah you were able to and they made these changes gaslighting the players <laughs> saying that it's because we're trying to deliver you guys a more valuable experience <laughs> we're doing it because we're trying to grow the game and the little bastards were freaking gaslighting the shit out of us <laughs> We're doing this for you guys' benefit. No, no, the hell you're not. You just want us to spend more money. I remember when I saw this, I was just like, what the hell happened with Apex? And then I read, I was like, oh, you guys are idiots. <laughs> if it's not broken, why try to fix it? Why try to ruin it? Oh, we want more money. Understandable. That's why. All right. Well, congrats. You ruined it. Giving you guys more value. That's really what it is. When anybody with any base level of intelligence can see how insulting it is to say something like that when it's so transparently not that. And they're not the only developer doing things like that. You see it across the board. So many developers that are making minor changes to their game, but oh, all of their focus is on their monetization. How else they can shift and move things around to make it where they can make more money and you get less out of yeah. playing the game. And in that, the only thing that you're serving to do is make an audience that isn't loyal to you, that is just waiting. <laughs> what was that whole thing that happened in Destiny as well? Uh, the the infamous uh, starter bundle that came with like very, very horrible things that did nothing to help new players and people called the living crap out of Bungie. They roasted the shit out of them because it was like a $15 transaction, which is very predatory because it's to new players. They have no idea what's going on. They see the store and they go, and if they have money and they go, I want to get invested. Oh, here's this starter bundle. Why not? Let's buy it. To us veterans, we saw that and went, this is dog shit. <laughs> Dude, nobody buy this bundle. And then Bungie immediately removed it. <laughs> thing at the mouth at the chance to be able to jump onto the next game and get as far away from you as they possibly can sure they're playing your game right now sure it's popular right now but that's because they don't really have another option and there's nothing else right now that's that hot dribble. so once there is something that hot that comes out you're done that's it players are a valuable resource 
And you I will I will admit throughout the so far for these 23 minutes, there are moments where you can hear this where you can hear legendary drop. His voice is going from like very stern. <laughs> and then there you have these moments of like you see it in his face like you can tell he's a gamer. He cares about video games and it's I'm with him. I feel the exact same way. You're frustrated and you just have to like breathe for a second of like what the what the hell's going on with video game companies nowadays? And that face, that good 2 second pause hit me really hard right now. You need to value them. They provide you with everything that you need to be successful, both creatively and financially. And if you use them the appropriate way, you can be huge, you can be massive. And while that's not the truth for every single game, because every single game is different, they have a different audience, they have a different use case, not, every play, not everybody plays the same kind of games. When you value them, they keep you afloat. They help you grow. And in the case of Digital Extremes and Warframe, I don't think that there's another developer that's out there that appreciates their audience the same way or does the same things that Digital Extremes does with their audience. Oh, yeah. Except for maybe Larian Studios. Why did you guys have to go and create a community YouTube channel? And even more <laughs> so, why am I not in it? I get it. Like, <laughs> Lowly and Co Carnage are really cool, but like, I made a lot of, I made a lot of videos on Baldur's Gate. Come on, man. Initially, I had wondered how Warframe was able to hold on to such a consistent player base for so long. Regardless of good or bad updates, new games, or financial declines, their core audience has stayed rock solid for over a decade now, and in that, in and of itself, that is a feat that very few games have accomplished. The mouth. It wasn't until I started streaming my experience over on Twitch, playing the game for the very first time, that I was exposed to the game's community, and in that, I noticed how positive they are. An eerily similar experience I had with Final Fantasy XIV, but altogether completely different. Mm -hmm. Many players have been playing the game since Alpha. They've unlocked everything in the game, effectively beaten the game, logging thousands of hours. However, they are still logging in regularly, even daily. They are out there guiding new players and doing things that they've done thousands of times because they love the game that much. And I was curious where that comes from. Well, sure, the game has regular updates, new content, new weapons, and new Warframes. I couldn't see how Warframe could become hey, somebody's daily go. driver until I saw how Digital Extremes engages with their community. Oftentimes, developers oh, lay yeah, silent between streams. content releases and major updates. They put their head in the sand, they let a couple people go out and respond or repost on Twitter, and only come out of hibernation to make promotional content to drive up interest around the next big update or major change. In that time of silence, I think it makes it feel like updates are further apart than they actually are. Players aren't engaged, and when they aren't engaged, they lose interest. And DE makes it really hard for you not to feel engaged as they support their community like they're content creators rather than game developers. Every single week, they go live on YouTube and Twitch to do something they call a dev short, where Steve Sinclair, the CEO of Digital Extremes, together with Rebecca Ford, the once community manager and now creative director of Warframe, and, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, voice of Space Mommy, Lotus, just talk to the players for 15 minutes. They answer questions, they tell them about things that they're working on, they joke around, they do this every week. What other game studios give that kind of transparency to the players? What other game companies are that grounded to make sure that their CEO of all people is constantly in contact with the players? No, None. Yeah. Pete's too busy and buying some cars, bro. that's not all they do. Every Wednesday and Thursday, they host primetime over on Twitch. Yeah. And each of them have their own separate streams for English and Spanish, where the developers and community managers come out to play the game with... Oh, God, I, I just... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think a lot of people. I just saw the pronouns. I'm like, just why? <laughs> the players. Have you ever heard of anything more absurd than that? Developers actually playing their game and playing their game with players. Holy with an, crap! I just noticed the amount of chats in that game. Look at all those chats right there. <laughs> that annoys me. Want to know why? That's the same feeling of seeing someone. Who has like 50 freaking Chrome tabs open. It pisses me off seeing that. Oh my gosh. It's up to 250,000 viewers giving away skins, Twitch mm -hmm. drops, different items, premium currencies. They Prime tell stories. Warframes. They play trivia games yep. with chat. And they show off different community art submissions. They are more involved with their community than I think any developer ever has been. And the fruits of their labor shine so brightly.
it shines in how positive their community is, how engaged they are, how well the game is developed and supported, how solid oh, dude, the monetization the is. It's why they are allowed to take the risk. I don't know if that cinematic is made by Blur Studios. I know Blur Studios helped out on one of the one of the trailers. I don't know if this is from them. God, dude, the freaking the cinematics were Blur Studios is just amazing. I'm sorry. If you don't know who a Blur Studio who Blue 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 uh, Blur Studios is, they're the ones behind the beautiful cinematic work, the whole remastering of the Halo of Halo 2 or technically the Master Chief Collection, where Halo 2 is just freaking beautiful risks with the games like they have and even with future games in development like soul frame the players know that they're oh, soul appreciated. Frame, I forgot. <laughs> they know that the developer is trying to achieve something and they can tell that they truly love what they are doing they can clearly see that these developers love their game and it shows digital extremes recognizes what many developers have slowly started to drift away from that players are a part of your game, and without them, your game wouldn't be what it is. Uh -huh. And in fact, for Warframe, that's literally true. In the early days of Warframe, movement is exactly what you would have expected the game to be. Just a over-the-shoulder, third-person shooter. It had sliding and running, but overall, the movement was slow. Players discovered an exploit where they called it oh, Zoran wait. Coptering. Where they oh, Coptering! <laughs> I said it in the beginning of the video, Coptering! There it is! <laughs> Oh my god, dude. Oh, Cop 3. I remember this. It was all over the pl freaking internet. Hey, dude, we discovered a freaking way to go fast, Cop 3. Just slide in midair and then you go zoom. <laughs> Could essentially fly across maps, sling themselves across maps and complete missions in a fraction oh, of the time. Dude. Instead of removing this, instead of standing against the players and changing something that the players were enjoying or doing, they recognized that the players were exploiting this because they were trying to avoid something that was actively ruining their experience. So Digital Extremes revamped the entire movement system for the game, reworking it from the ground up to be one of the most fluid movement systems in all of gaming. Oh, such this an video took a lot longer to record than to I do. thought it would. It's already dark outside. You might actually end up hearing my cat chattering with another cat that shows up outside. This is an <laughs> orange cat. They just kind of talk through the window. Yeah, good old cat it's behavior. Normal. I know how you feel. <laughs> Over the last few years, I've noticed a conversation that's popped up between game developers and game journalists, and they're talking about how cold and unfeeling and how unsympathetic gamers are towards the plight of the industry, how some of these companies are failing, how games are failing, how companies are going out of business, how people are losing their jobs, and they are absolutely right. Because at the end of the day, we are consumers, we're buying games, and if you do not make a game that we want to play, and it was we'll it worth angry. our money and we we'll waste it on your game and you go out of business as a result of that? That's on you. Mm -hmm. You got what you got coming to you. It sucks, but, but it's it true. It didn't used to be like that. And I think the reason why is because back, and this is something that's just kind of evolved oh, over time, is that many of the companies that are out there right now, some of the biggest companies that are out there right now, came from humble beginnings, no different than Larian Studios or Digital Extremes or anyone else that's out there. When they were smaller, they felt like they were one of us because they were, they were, they were yep. one of us. They were How many, frick, oh my God, Bungie, I remember seeing like the, the videos of Bungie. It was like just a, a couple of employees and they seemed like down to earth, freaking nerd gamers, which basically transcribed to us, the consumers, they're gamers like us. They know it's like the slogan for Razer for gamers by gamers. It was basically that. And then you see the videos of that they have of like the them filming inside the the company and it's just them like eating pizza and playing freaking halo in their freaking company that that was more that was very appealing to gamers and then now you look at bungie now and it's a freaking shit show they were players that were making games because they wanted to make cool games for them to play and for other people to play yup but as time went on and they got bigger and they made more money and they started selling out and Oh, well, I should also say, when I said now, you also have to do remember, I forgot, the old employees are practically no longer there. So it's all new people, basically. Things come, things go. And it sucks that we're in this, where it felt like Bungie was humble beginnings, player, gamers making games to play with other gamers and for them to play with friends. So now where it just feels like a greedy corporation, I want more money so I can buy these stupid ass expensive cars. Literally selling out to other companies, what ended up happening is, is that that conversation changed. That 
interaction that we used to have, that relationship that we used to have with the developers, that parasocial-like relationship that we had, started to disappear because they started talking to us through a veil of money. Mm. It was always apology letters and tweets. Bars. Just trying to manipulate the truth more than anything else. It's all gaslighting. Yep. You're not trying to help us. You're not trying to do anything for us. You're just trying to make money. And to be honest with you, it's cowardice. It's so disgusting. Like if you just want to make money, go make money, dog. Say you're doing it for it. I'd almost have more respect for a company that just laid their nuts out on the table and said, we're doing it because we want your money. Yeah. Rather than trying to paint it in these colorful words to try to make it feel like they're our friends and really this is all just for you guys. I, honestly, yeah. I, w I would love it if companies were extremely more truthful. Like uh, when Destiny 1 was being announced, they said that they were going to introduce like a very intricate story, a big ass freaking map, and then multiple freaking planets and then when the game was released we didn't get half of the amount of planets that they promised or whatever the maps they weren't as big and then the story <laughs> i don't have time to explain why i don't have time to explain <laughs> shut up <laughs> i feel like if destiny or bungie at the time if they were more truthful i feel like if they were just straight up like we're gonna be very truthful give us more time for the story give us more time for the planets we can it's not gonna be out in launch we promise we'll try our best to deliver it. We'll, you know, give you updates of what's going on. I feel like people would have been a bit more understanding. But the fact that they sh they throw it out like a sales pitch, like, hey, this coming was everything. It's coming was this. It's coming was all this and all this from the start of the game. And then it doesn't. You get pissed off because you just, you lied. That's not what it is. I think there's a lot to learn from a company like Digital Extremes, especially in the way that they stay connected with their audience. That level of connection brings in insane levels of endearment where the people that are playing the game just genuinely love the work that the people are doing because they like the people too. They like both things at the exact same time and that is, that's an awesome thing to have. My cat is freaking out right now. <laughs> that's an awesome thing to have because players at the end of the day we like, want kitty. to be appreciated. We want to be heard. And the more we're heard and the more we're appreciated and the more that the game is actually worth our time and money, the more likely we are to continue to invest in that game and invest mm -hmm. in future things that you do. However, the vast majority of the industry is really doing nothing other than creating unloyal fan bases. Sure, your game might be doing okay now, but the minute that somebody else comes by, like Digital Extremes or something like that, that does the same things that they do, or better, <laughs> your audience is gone. You know what I feel like it, it is? It's like, um, for example, what I feel like gaming companies are doing now is, uh, it kind of feels like the whole Jack Dor Dorky and Neon situation where they get views and money from hatred versus someone like Charlie who gets views and money from people caring about him because he's actually a freaking down to earth guy the same thing here digital extreme is down to earth they care about their product they care about their audience and people will shower them with money because they're like oh you guys are awesome here's my money for some cosmetics and then you have games like call of duty and freaking <laughs> bungie and all this where it's more like we hate you but you have a game that we kind of care about but we hate you but we're giving you i don't know why i'm giving you money but i hate you <laughs> i think there's a lot to learn from this i really do that's the whole reason i make these wake up call videos in the first place is because I think there is a lot to learn from some of the best studios that are on the market. Some of the best oh, games kitty. that are on the market. And there's a ton of them. There is. And I plan on doing a ton of these videos because they're okay. They're a lighthouse, an opportunity for those who have drifted too far away to finally see the light, come back to land, touch grass and find out what, well, players, I don't think like, they will. what players really want and how to talk to players again. All these are case studies for these companies to see and be like, oh, I see what we're doing wrong. They, they don't do anything. <laughs> they don't change. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I did. Thank you guys for watching it this long. It was an if honor. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. If you I like will. the video and want more people to see it, throw a like on the video. Follow me on Twitch if you guys want to see me play Warframe or other and games and talk Twitch. about video game news and all that good stuff. Outside Go check of that, the homie I'm going to take off. Stay cool, stay righteous, stay safe, my friends, and I will see you next time. Peace. All right. Well, very. I, I feel like crying because he basically, he, yeah, it, it hit home. That's basically everything he said about all these companies is basically how I feel in the end. Very interesting video. Even though I love Warframe, I'm a veteran 
OG Warframe player. There are still moments where I will dip out because I played, I have did every content that I liked and did for a while, and then I'll dip out and play something else. It's inevitable. It's just how I am. There are obviously there's people out there who without anything, no incentive, like they're a streamer for Warframe. They're a content creator for Warframe. They're just regular Joes who go to their nine and five, nine to five job, come back and play Warframe. They'll play it every day. To be honest, I don't know how they do that. That's my, my brother. I do everything in Destiny 2 and I'm like, I feel fulfilled. I feel like I got everything that I needed. I'm going to go dip and play something else. And then I see my brother and he's still playing it, doing every little thing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this reaction video, ladies and gentlemen. It's my first time ever attempting to do this. And I'm not going to lie. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully Hopefully, I, I feel like I didn't do something that a lot of people hated. Uh, what is his name? Jinxy of just looking and going, huh? I actually try to do a bit of commentary to, you know, give my insight of what he's talking about. Kind of want to do another reaction video. So if there's something you want me to react to, let me know down in the comments. I'll, I'll see if I can check it out and then do another reaction video. Because like I said, one more time, it was actually enjoyable doing this. Legendary drop. Love your video. Love that we're rocking the same mic, st <laughs> mic stand and the same microphone. <laughs> Remember, sub and like. Remember to sub to Legendary Drop. And like his video. Go check out his video. It's in the description. And uh, yeah, peace, ladies and gentlemen. Peace.